So I'm just going to introduce you real quickly. This is Jerry McCamey. Um, it is the 11th mm -hmm. of January, 2004, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm at Jerry's house in Gaithersburg, mm -hmm. Maryland, um, and this is the Rocky Flats Cold War Museum Oral History Project and the Carnegie Library Oral History Project. Um, so, and I'm Hannah Nordhaus, did I say that? Um, so, uh, to begin, I'd just like to know a little of your personal background, where you were born, where when you were born, where you grew up, what your parents did, and where you're educated, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, I was born in Houston, Texas, in August 5th, 1955. I grew up in Dallas, so I'm a native Texan. Uh, I went to the undergraduate school at the University of Texas at Arlington where I got a degree in physics. And for graduate school I went to uh, the Ohio State University. I got a PhD in nuclear physics, experimental nuclear physics at Ohio State in 1982. Um, my father was a um, salesman. My mom was a telephone company operator. And uh, I have no brothers or sisters, I'm an only child, so um, it's just me. I was always interested in physics, and so that's what I wanted to do, uh, at least in graduate school whenever, for a while. Um, so you family, you want interested in family? Uh, I met my wife in, o in Ohio, going to graduate school, and graduated in 1982. Took a job as a, a geophysicist with Amico Production Company in Houston thinking that we'd go back to Texas. And at the time, and this is kind of an ironic twist, I was trying to avoid uh, defense-oriented work. So I went into, into petroleum and doing um, oil exploration. Uh, it turns out we didn't, like, uh, we didn't like living in Houston. And uh, as a physicist, I, I got a job, heard of a job opening at some place called Rocky Flats to come do applied nuclear physics research. And uh, I applied to the ad, and that's how we left Houston, and I left geophysics and became an employee at Rocky Flats. Did you know that it was defense-related when you applied? No, I did, I did not know. And I did not know what, at all what they did. Uh, I only had some vague, uh, vague impressions of the total scope of things even after I was immediately hired and took the job. I mean, I knew what I was going to be doing, but I wasn't quite certain what the whole plant was about at the very beginning. Um, why did you not want to get into defense-related fields? Uh, two things. One is I had seen a, uh, I was used to, had a bunch of relatives in the Department of Defense funding, I mean, doing defense contracting kind of work. Mm -hmm. I didn't like the boom and bust cycles, you know, of following the contracts where people would have to would go through layoff cycles and they'd work for this defense contractor for so long and then work for that one and, and they were just always at the mercy of, of congressional funding and, and moving here and there. And I didn't really want to be part of the, of the of a war machine at the time, believe it or not. So that was it. anti-war kind of certainly more of a pacifist coming out of a college than then probably I was later. I'll probably move back towards the middle a little bit later, yeah. Okay, so um, so you heard that there's a job opening Rocky Flats. You had no idea what they did. Nope. Uh, and when did you figure out figure out what you were going to be doing and what the plant was doing? I don't remember how long it took me to figure out what the plant was doing, but it was probably sometime my first year there. Oh, you didn't know when you got there? I knew it was nuclear. I knew it had something to do with... Uh, you know, they always told you the plutonium trigger words, right? But I wor my job was to become a research specialist at the critical mass laboratory. Uh, so the applied nuclear physics that we were doing was uh, critical mass lab experiments to validate the criticality safety codes that the criticality safety engineers used. And so in that regard, I didn't need to know a whole lot about the, uh, what the rest of the plant did right off the bat. And uh, it was probably th that first year I remember getting some tours of some of the facilities and the, the whole picture opens up to you as to what, what it's about. And um, was the, so what year was it that you came? I hired in June 1983. And yet, did you have to do all the background checks? Oh yeah, yeah. Back then it was quick. Uh, they were complaining about how long it took, but the queue clearance only took three months for me, so. So um, when you got there, was the, um, 
professional culture very different from your previous job? Yeah. Um, at, when I was a geophysicist, the geophysicists that worked for Amico were elite individuals. I mean, we ha I had a seventh floor uh, private corner office of a nice high-rise Amico Towers in Houston, mauve and blue, decorated. I mean, you know, easy overstuffed, and you know, I was an entry-level geophysicist, right? So you come to Rocky Flats, you know, and you get a, you get a QB and an old battle gray desk, and uh, you know, everything is Spartan, to say the least. So yeah, that was a bit of a shock, but it, it wasn't so unusual to doing physics graduate work because the physics graduate students do a lot of grunt work and I wasn't so, so removed from, from that. Probably one of the, the, the wildest experiences for me was is being um, in graduate school, like my, one of my professors said, as a physics person, one of the things that they want you to do is get to where you can do anything in the laboratory at all, so you can run the laboratory. So I was used to doing that, and so when we came there to do research, I just did everything. I mean, if we needed to make um, radiation measurements or a personal dosimetry, I just did it. If we needed to go get something from the store, I just did it. Well, I found out quickly at Rocky there, were, there was a partition of roles and responsibilities. Certain union crafts had it, so I, was, I must have caused two or three union grievances my first year there, because <laughs> I was just like, oh, if it was just work needed to be done, I just went and did it. I didn't know I wasn't authorized to, to go to the warehouse and get certain things, you know. So I caused my management grief <laughs> in a small way early on. <laughs> and did, they, uh, did they come down on you or? It was no big deal. I just got an education, you know. That's a union thing. We had to pay the union, those, the, those employees, those, those hours for, for that work you did for them. And don't do that again. So you learn quick, quickly. Was the, um, so the union was very powerful? Oh, yes, very much so. Did you have much interaction other than working with union folks and the, the job stuff? You weren't managing? I never managed uh, union employees myself, no. Uh, yeah, we worked closely with them as coworkers um, and um, them. I mean, they were, they, the majority of the people at the plant were union folks doing the, the basic nuts and bolts work. And I always used to, this was years later when I was a manager in crit criticality safety, I used to tell my staff that we work for those guys and gals men and women with their hands in the glove box. Our job was to help them do their job safely because if anything was going to happen, it was going to happen to them, not us. And so we work for them. I mean, we have the degrees and we have all this, but in truth, we're just there to serve the guys with their hands in the gloves. So I always told my staff, our mission is to make sure moms and dads go home safe every night. I don't want anybody not going home at night. Was there, was there any, was there tension besides the grievances with, you know, the, the partitions and the sort of structure of it, was there tension between union and management with you? Well, the grievances was no big deal. It was just me learning how the plant right. worked, you know. I was just a new kid coming in thinking you could just, oh, boss said I need this, I go do it. Uh, that's, that's how that was. That was no big thing. The only time I, uh, in my experience that there was some tension, but in retrospect I think it was healthy, was uh, around any time the union contracts came up. Um, usually the union officers ran on a safety platform. And in criticality safety, what we saw just leading up to uh, a new contract was a, a peak in the number of reported criticality safety infractions, where there were rule violations or procedure violations. All of a sudden they would, there would be a larger number just in advance of a new contract. And, um, the thinking at the time was is the union wanted to make a case that the plant wasn't as safe as it needed to be and was doing that to reporting better uh, things that were happening so that they could have a case to be made for concessions for management. So the things, the things were really happening? Oh yeah, they were happening. Um, scary thing was you, scary thing. The thing we worried about as a crit safety people was were they happening other parts of the time and just not being reported because the only way to fix problems was to report them and then fix them. If people weren't reporting them and handling them appropriately, that's, that's when you can get into trouble. And would they not have reported them before because they didn't want to get into trouble or because um, it just was a hassle? Sense? 
these are in my early days when I was a staff member, so I wasn't in management when some of this stuff was going on. Um, I can't say that there was ever any punishment for anybody reporting criticality safety infractions. Um, so I, I think it was just a, maybe an attitude of uh, just keep on going. You know, production, production was number one. There was no question. You probably heard that before. But um, from 1983 when I started at the site until 1990, the 89-90 time frame, the important feature of the site was to make production schedules. I mean, that was it. Uh, and even in safety, we all knew that our jobs were to really fundamentally support the production schedules. So nothing, you didn't want anything shutting that down for very long. It was the whole, whole scheme of things. Did you, were there ever times when you felt pressured to uh, make decisions that weren't, that you didn't feel comfortable with safety? I never had to make a decision that I was uncomfortable with. However, it didn't mean I didn't feel the pressure. I anticipated it. Um, there was a, one, one story was as we were, we were working on a new, a new unit and it was still in the research phase and so we were having a lot of troubles with some of the, the metallurgy. A new unit being a... A new, uh, a new trigger, right. A new, new plutonium kind. part, a new kind. Okay. Yes, a new kind. And uh, it wasn't yet in the stockpile, it was a brand new design. And so anytime a new design came in, the metallurgist in the, would have to go through several kinds of experimental castings to get the castings right, the metallurgy right, the timing right, the casting amount, shapes right. And so it was kind of an R&D process. And we, I was working very closely with the um, design engineers and the, um, on the project. And we, we were anticipating, we had a, a test shot in Nevada coming up. That was the deadline because back then there was the underground testing was still going on. Mm -hmm. And so we were, we were getting ready to build a live unit so that it could go to Nevada to be tested underground. And we had a, you know, we had a delivery date that we had to meet. And we were working three shifts at the time trying to get this thing built. And uh, the good news was I had worked so closely with the engineer that he knew exactly where his limits were, his constraints from a criticality safety um, pro project was. So on the third shift, middle, middle of a third shift, the, another casting went bad and so we weren't going to make the deadline. But, and I knew if I'd come in the next morning, because we had like one day left before we needed to make the build, get it on the SST and get it going, or we were going to miss the deadline, right? So I show up at work this morning after we've been going through all this. I show up at work, there's all these calls on my machine saying, we need new limits and we need them within two hours, and if we can't get them within two hours, you will be talking to the plant president. Um, because we had this failure again on the third shift. Well, fortunately, the engineer knew exactly what the constraints were. He made all the design changes in the middle of the night, showed me all the design changes, had them all on my desk. Because he knew exactly what I was thinking, it was already pre-approved, pre-designed. It was like, there's no big deal. I, we could just do the approvals. So it was like, hey, we're done. We made, we made schedule uh, and was all completely safe. But it was, but it was there. And I, had he not done so much of all right, had we not worked so closely together, safety and production, which I think was the right way to do it, uh, yeah, there w it could have been very uncomfortable, you know, to come in from scratch and, and, try, to make that and try to make that work. Right. Um, why don't you quickly explain, I spent five hours with Bob Rothy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, as you can imagine. Um, and uh, so we, we talked a lot about criticalities, but if you could just, just, just sort of run through exactly what your job was, what a criticality is, and, um, and just sort of talk about that. Okay. Um, a criticality accident is an uncontrolled nuclear chain reaction. It's whenever you get a, a critical mass of plutonium, in the case of Rocky Flats, or uranium, um, it's you get a, a lot of neutrons and a lot of gamma rays emitted quickly, potentially fatal within 10 meters, typically. It's not an explosion, 
Uh, it's not a bomb. Uh, usually uh, in the 30 or so accidental criticalities that have happened worldwide since the inception of this nuclear business, there's basically been no damage. I mean, there's no facility damage. There's no large spread of contamination. It's, a, it's just a very intense burst of radiation in the local region. Uh, so that's what a criticality accident is. It can happen if you get too much mass in a one location at the right time. If you can, if you add water or moderator to a system because um, of the way the nuclear physics works, um, lower energy neutrons are absorbed better than higher energy neutrons. And by scattering off of water, they slow down, they, they become less energetic, and therefore they become captured in plutonium easier, and therefore they they cause fissions. And every time you cause a fission, you get two more neutrons out. And if you have enough material together for those neutrons to go off and cause more fissions, you end up with a chain reaction. Uh, so that's what a criticality accident is. Uh, it's usually lethal to people uh, within 10 meters. And so again, that's the reason why I mentioned our job was really protecting the workers. It wasn't an off-site problem. I mean, it was not a public issue. It's not even an issue for somebody over in another building. But you know, there was so much glove box work at Rocky Flats. It's for the workers' safety, you know, right there working in the glove box. And the political ramifications of a criticality accident would be tremendous. Um, if people are worried about contamination, uh, if the public is, is concerned about that, you can only imagine uh, the problems for the country uh, and for the site if somebody died in a radiation accident, which is what would happen. Uh, at the time, uh, we were concerned about maintaining our production because we were a defense facility. I mean, we were directly linked to the to this country's strategic defense. Uh, what we made ended up on submarines, ended up on missiles, and we were in a Cold War situation with the Soviet Union at the time. And if our plant went down uh, due to something like this, that would affect national security potentially. So we didn't want any of that to happen. So beyond just killing a few people, there was even all this national ramifications. So there's both the sort of the terror it would inspire, I guess. Right. The, the, sort of the, the horror. Of radiation. Right. And then the fact that the plant would be able to produce. Right. But it's amazing. Uh, the public tolerates deaths at government facilities and all kinds of accidents, but they don't have a very high tolerance for radiation-induced deaths. I mean, um, DOE electrocutes or runs over people or squishes people. I don't mean that at all make light of it. But, I mean, industrial kinds of accidents happen in DOE facilities all the time, and they're not being shut down. But who knows how bad it would have been had uh, we ever lost a person in a radiation accident. Why do you think that is? People are scared of radiation. I think they don't understand it. Um, the general public just knows that it's bad in their thinking and, uh, and uh, scared of it. Something you can't see, right? Very little appreciation of it. Uh, one time in the plutonium on the du in the ducks public presentations, there was um, a, a, a spike came out of one of the stack monitors at the same time we were reporting on the plutonium in the ducks, and it was higher than normal. I don't remember what the nor numbers were, but it was much higher than typical, and and the public was really worried about this. And one of our guys at the site said, let's put this in perspective. The amount of radiation that just got released from that uh, stack is roughly equivalent to eating two bananas. Uh, bananas have potassium-41 in them naturally, which is a naturally occurring radioactive isotope, and we were able to measure such small amounts and track such small amounts that you know when you see very little and then you see a, a big bump on a chart, it looks horrible. But in reality, it was just a, it was two bananas. Now some people thought we were being flipped when we said that, but it was an honest attempt to say, look, put this in perspective. You eat bananas all the time. You're eating radiation as part of your natural environment. Uh, you've got to kind of keep in perspective what's a safety issue and what isn't. A criticality accident is a for sure safety problem. <laughs> Make no mistake about that. But there's, there's and by the way, for the record, crit uh, Rocky Flats never in the entire history of the site had a criticality accident. And um, I think everybody should be very proud of that. It's not to say there weren't some close calls in the operating history of the site, but it never happened. Uh, one of the few Department of Energy 
uh, weapon sites that never had a criticality accident. Um, and were the other criticality accidents all, were they all, you know, was it always the same scenario or someone, was it accidental, someone put, didn't realize how close the plutonium was together or? Typically, in the U.S., in the U.S. history of accidents, uh, the, the scenario was pretty similar in every case. That always involved um, fissile material in a solution. Because, um, you know, like, you know, building 771 was in a solution recovery building. I mean, the idea was to put plutonium in solution and recover the plutonium from the solution. So it was kind of a recycling facility, if you will. Um, so we had a lot of plutonium solution at the site. Other sites did too, plutonium and uranium solutions uh, in recovery processes. And it, typically it was um, a solution. Almost always it was somebody violating a procedure, not doing the way things the way they were supposed to do it, taking a shortcut, thinking they could do it faster, quicker, thinking it was okay to change how they were doing business normally. Or uh, another one that the common indicator was they would um, invent a new process and not have it properly analyzed. You know, somebody on a back shift would say, hey, I can do this uh, process uh, quicker and easier if instead of following that plumbing or through those valves, I just bypass all that and I go do it over here. And uh, they didn't know what they were doing. So, but it was all solutions. So, uh, from a criticality safety perspective, uh, our biggest worry was the uh, solution facilities. Not to say we weren't worried about some of the metal facilities at all, but I mean, solution facilities were the ones where the highest risk were. Why was that? Again, I'll think of it, solutions uh, move, mm -hmm. solutions flow, solutions are hard to quantify. If I'm looking at uh, metal parts, I can count them and they stay in the same shape. Mm -hmm. And so if I know that, that if I'm only allowed like one on a table like the coffee cup, I can look, there's only one. But if I, can, if I tell you, oh by the way, you can only have 300 grams per liter um, plutonium nitrate solution in this tank. There's a tank. How do you know it's 300 grams per liter? How do you know it's all in that tank and not in that tank? And if I tell you it's not allowed in that tank, how do you know that? How do you prevent it from going from there to there in case, because you can siphon, there's, you can have the wrong valve lineups, et cetera. Um, but it's easier just to count metal. So that's a, that's a big chunk of it. Solution moves around in ways you don't expect sometimes, and it's harder to contain, and it's harder to see what you got. So um, there are there are criticality accidents in other facilities. Do people die in them? Oh yeah, there was. There's been only there's been only two uh, accidental um, criticality accidents that caused deaths to workers in process facilities, mm -hmm. uh, plants like Rocky Flats. Um, uh, one was at Wood River Junction, uh, where in fact that's on this videotape here. We reenacted it. One was uh, at Wood River Junction, where a fellow. Um, was decided to do a, 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 a uranium recovery process and decided to uh, dump a bunch of extra uranium into an open 55 gallon drum and uh, it went critical while he was pouring it and he died. Uh, at Los Alamos there was the other fatality. Um, that worker bypassed some of the procedures for some of the valve lineups he was supposed to filter and recirculate some of the plutonium solutions. He decided to be quicker, it was on a holiday, he was getting ready for New Year's Eve party and he got distracted, thought he could do it quicker and he skipped the process and so higher concentration plutonium ended up in a tank than he expected and whenever he turned on a, a pump it stirred it up and it reached a critical geometry and, and he died. That's it, there's only been two. Did they end do they know, so you see there's no explosion. Do they have any idea anything is going on? Oh yeah, there were radiation alarms. Uh, all the sites have uh, criticality detectors now um, whose sole purpose it is is to alarm, alarm in case these intense radiation fields happen. Because if we can get the workers out away from the facility quickly, um, they'll live. Because again, the lethal radiation fields tend to only be within the first 10 meters or so. I mean, if you're more than 30 feet away when one happens and you get away, you'll, you'll live. And so that was the whole purpose. And at, at Los Alamos, they didn't have any specific criticality alarms in the area. Mm -hmm. 
Um, however, they had a bunch of radiation instrumentation that pegged and, and the guy knew it. He, he actually was a research, uh, no, he wasn't a researcher. Uh, that particular individual um, actually felt, felt badly due to the radiation and he exited and some alarms went off in other facilities but they were ancillary radiation alarms. So they knew something had happened. And did he die right there? He died within I think three days, two or three days. It's not it is not pleasant. Yeah. It is not a way to die, no. And you know more recently in the world there were uh, criticality accidents in Japan in 1999 mm -hmm. um, in which two individuals died. And, um, a nuclear uh, power plant? And it was a uh, uranium recovery facility in Tokaimura, Japan. And it's very similar. These, these, um, these individuals bypassed their normal procedures. Uh, they were using higher enriched uranium than they were, they were normally used to using. They, they ad-libbed the process and put too much uranium in a tank and it went critical. And, um, classic recipe for disaster. So these things aren't unheard of these days. We've just been very fortunate in the United States we haven't had a criticality accident since 78 anywhere in the United States. That was the Los Alamos one in 78? No, the last one in 1978 was at the Idaho Chemical Processing Plant and there was no fatalities, no radiation exposures, no injuries because it was in a remote, under, a remote shielded facility. And so again because it's only a localized radiation problem uh, nobody was there, and so there was enough time, distance, and shielding. Nobody got hurt. So, if you're out of the, the um, 10 meter range, will you still get sick, or is it just is the radiation of the rays just really focused in this water? It's it's just a standard time, distance, and shielding thing. It's just um, it's just like a light source gets dimmer, right? The farther away you get, that's all there is. Is and so if you're, it's not an intense enough radiation field to where. Uh, it's just like these light bulbs. If you back off, you know, 50 or 100 meters, you see a lot less light from them, right? right. Same thing. That's all that's happening. And it's just not intense enough to cause a problem out beyond that. Will it cause the health problems long term, do you think? 15 meters? I mean, you know, out beyond 30 meter, out beyond 30 feet, 10 meters or so, you're still talking doses on the order of 50 to 100 rad. I mean, it's measurable biological effects. It's mm -hmm. higher doses than you particularly want. I mean, you could see biochemistry changes, but those individuals will live. Long term, I don't know what the prognosis would be. I think, I think that some of the studies of some of the other individuals who have received doses in criticality accidents, they live fairly normal lives because they were like the one in, in Oak Ridge in 58, uh, there were several individuals received like 25 and 50 uh, rim, things of those kinds of natures, and uh, they didn't see any problem that, to my knowledge, that were attributed to radiation effects. Your body has pretty good tolerance for it, really, and it's not a large number of individuals, so, you know, statistically speaking, I'm sure if you, the epidemiologist could probably tell you if you put if you dosed, you know, 10,000 people with 50 rim in an acute way, you'd see so many much more latent something or other. So it's not good, but you won't die then. Right. The the folks that are receiving four or five hundred rim or more, uh, they will die within a few days. Um. That was our job. Our job was to prevent that, <laughs> and we did. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so and. Um, it seems like there's always this, this issue with when people discuss safety at Rocky Flats with short term versus long term. Uh huh. And it sounds like the criticality is really a short term. It's a short term it's issue, short -term exactly. Yeah. yeah, it really is. Okay. And um, was, was that the, the biggest thing you had to worry about at Rocky Flats? Was, or not, obviously, not you, but one at biggest, the worst accident that could happen would be a criticality accident? Actually, no. The worst accident probably would be a fire. We had fires at Rocky Flats, like the 69 fire. That, I mean, those kinds of things are very much more threatening because the potential to destroy all of the containment and put large amounts of plutonium into the air and in the soil and, sur and the surrounding communities, those are really worse. Mm -hmm. And they also have the potential uh, to 
to trigger other kinds of accidents. I mean, one of the big concerns fighting the 69 fire was that you would cause a criticality accident while you were fighting it because you're going in and putting water on things. And, uh, we didn't have a criticality accident, but you could have. And so, the water would spread it around and it would move and get close together. Right, and it also it slows down those neutrons and it makes a big difference whenever you're, uh, you're changing the, um, the, new, the energies of the neutrons um, because it's, all, it's actually all nuclear physics. That's why they hire nuclear physicists to understand this stuff. <laughs> it's because the uh, fission cross-sections increase with uh, lower energy neutrons. And so the ability to cause more fissions goes up if you add water to a system, typically. Uh, so water's not good in general. And so well, they were just lucky that it didn't happen. Yeah, yeah. It's not easy to cause a criticality, uh, which is another thing. I mean. Uh, like my job, my first job at uh, Rocky Flats where I worked with Dr. Rothi who was at the Critical Mass Laboratory. Our job was to make uh, these zero power reactors. I'm sure he told you that. We actually drove things exactly critical. Uh, and we had a control. It was a reactor essentially, but it was a zero power reactor. And it was, I mean, you have to adjust things just so to actually achieve criticality. If you, uh, it's easier to make things subcritical than critical. So it's, it's not like it's trivial to make a critical mass. You, you were going all the way to critical, right? You oh, no, we were critical. Edge, oh, no, we were critical. One, right at one. 1.0 1. is what we were trying to get. That won't hurt anybody. 1.1 1. 1 will kill people. <laughs> uh, yes, that's, and that was. And, and, uh, and a lot of the criticality accidents that have occurred in, in facilities have been in these experimental facilities because um, we are trying to m measure exactly one, take the system to exactly critical. And that means in reactor language, you have an infinite period. So that uh, instead of the reaction doubling very quickly, which gives you rise in power, you want it to be on a very long period, which means the power increases very slow. So there's no intense radiation fields. There's no, it is critical. It is an exact balance and you get and every neutron causes fission instead of, you know, having, basically that's all criticality is, is do you have more neutrons causing fission or do you have neutrons escaping and causing no fissions? That's all it is. And if you make sure a lot of neutrons cause a lot of extra fissions, you have a lot of extra power and that's what causes the problems. But if you can make it exactly balanced, it's no, not an issue. And again, so if a, if a criticality happens and we didn't have any monitors, right? or any, you know, you had to have no idea that it happened at the first that you'd be dead. Yeah, you'd have, yeah, the, the nearby workers would be dead. But that's not an issue. It's almost always detected. I mean, the, the good news is, for example, in this Tokamura accident, uh -huh. uh, they didn't expect a criticality where that occurred either. And so they had no, immediate, no radiation detectors in the nearby vicinity. Uh -huh. However, there was uh, research institutes miles and miles away detected the neutrons. Really? Yeah, so they knew it happened. These things uh, are hard to miss because even though the radiation fields aren't life-threatening, they're detectable and so from a long distance. And so you can be hundreds of meters away and detect it. Um, just act, oh, why, why, why did all my radiation detectors go off scale? Why am I suddenly seeing that something's happening? So they're, they're hard to miss. There's never been one missed. And I guess if you know it's going off the scale and there's no, nothing that's, that's happening in your vicinity, it can right? only be a criticality then? Is well, people start asking questions because, you know, right. what's, what's going on and, and, uh, and of course, it, if you start following your radiation instruments, you can go back to the source because it is, the light gets more, the radiation gets more intense the closer you get. It doesn't go away instantly either because you get build up a lot of fission products in the, and the material that's radioactive. So it builds, 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 then it crit gets critical. Bursts. Bursts. And, there's a and then it shuts itself down, typically. And then, um, but you've made a lot of fission products that are very high, much more radioactive than the original uh, set of plutonium and uranium you had there. And so that continues to emit potentially dangerous radiation fields in the very near vicinity, mm -hmm. potentially for a couple of days afterwards. So it's easy to detect. It's interesting. Yeah. It's, it's interesting that it's an accident you can't see or hear or 
Nothing. No? no. Uh, well, you may have, I don't know if Dr. Rothy told you, one of the things the nearby people talk about are the things called the blue flash. There's biological, um, people see what they report is a blue flash in their eyes if they're nearby. And the thinking is it's the uh, passage of radiation through the fluid in the eyes causing um, Trinkoff radiation. Uh, if, you, if you've seen these pictures of reactor cores and there's all blue light around it, uh -huh. that's because electrons are being slowed down in that media. Um, they're going faster than the speed of light in that media mm -hmm. water. And so they emit this radiation as blue. Uh, but uh, victims or people in the very near vicinity of these criticality accidents, their eyes detect it. They see the blue flash. So they don't actually, it's not that they see it coming from anywhere, but this, everything, goes, everything goes blue, blue right? And then it passes? Oh yeah, it's just like instantaneous. You never want to see that. Yeah, <laughs> go, go find a nice pool reactor and see the blue glow there. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so... Uh, we talked about criticalities. Okay, um, you mentioned the near miss criticality in '94. Um, mm -hmm. Was that the only one, or that you were present for? Or? That was the one I was most involved with. Um, there were some in the lore of the site that I were, was not personally involved with. Um, let me set the background for 1994 uh, a little bit. Um, In 19, I think it was 1992, um, first President Bush announced the, um, basically the closure of the site, and we were no, no longer going to produce um, W-88s um, for Trident missiles. And uh, we were going to shut down. And at that time, the plant, was from, 19, from 1989 through 1992, the plant was in this mode of Let's shut down for safety reasons and environmental reasons, but let's get geared up, let's get safe enough, let's get clean enough, let's, get, let's do what it takes to operate safely. And then the plant gets shut down in 19, with his announcement and his State of the Union address in 1992 that we weren't going to operate again. Well, then the pendulum started swinging, well, we're not going to produce again, we're going to close. Therefore, we don't need to be as, we need to get in a big hurry for closure and we don't need to spend as much money on all this safety and as much time on all this safety. We just want to close. At the same time, the environmental concerns were really ramped up due to the FBI raid, et cetera. And so everybody was concerned about RICRA violations and about getting fined if they didn't clean up spills properly or if solutions escaped, et cetera. So the culture changed between 1992 to 1994 of being, let's get ready to, to go make triggers again to let's clean up and shut down where the, the driver of the site was now environmental cleanup. Mm -hmm. And so the safety that people were mostly concerned about at the time was environmental safety. And so the pendulum had swung towards the operators on the floor, the guys working the box, their management had so ingrained them that they did not want a fine for plutonium solution spilling on the floor that the operators were more concerned about that spill than they were about avoiding a criticality accident because they had started to believe that a criticality couldn't happen. So we, my staff, I was the criticality safety manager for EG&G at the time, we started seeing these, the operators willing to take chances in criticality safety because they thought they thought an accident could no longer happen, but they knew that they could get in trouble if they spilled. Mm -hmm. So they would try to permit spills. They would try to collect spills. They would, if they saw a spill happening, they were telling us, well, I'll put a bag under it. I'll put a bucket under it because I know we'll get fined if it hits the floor and it runs outside of the berm and yada, yada, yada. Well, those are all precisely the kinds of accidents, actions that will cause a criticality accident. So, in the year of 1993-94 early, I was trying, I and my staff were trying to warn senior management that the criticality safety culture had degraded significantly. That, that management was trying to rush the cleanup process too much. 
uh, that they weren't investing the time in building 771, for example, in the conduct of operations culture to make sure that operators were really going to follow their procedures precisely. And that the operators were telling us that uh, when it came down to a RICRA issue or a criticality safety issue, they would comply with RICRA and forget criticality safety. We were trying to alert the plant management that we were seeing a culture that was disregarding criticality safety. Well, those, those warnings went unheeded. And so I was, I actually left uh, the contractor. I had become convinced that the plant was headed for a criticality accident. And I told them so. I told senior management that I think uh, you're going to have a criticality accident within the next five years if you don't change what you're doing. And I can't do anything about it anymore. And so I quit. <laughs> And so, uh, literally, like a month after uh, I became a consultant for DOE, we were on a tour in Building 771 after one of these tank draining operations. And I was touring some other criticality safety engineers from DOE along, because I had knowledge of the facility, so we were on an inspection. And we walk into this glove box, and there's all these bottles with this Plutonium solution is green. Plutonium nitrate solution is green. And it had all these bottles lined up in this, in this glove box. And it was like, well, most of them are pale green, which means it's lower concentration. But there were a couple of bottles that were pretty dark green. And it was like, well, where did those come from? Well, the answer was it came out of this tank. I forget the number. The same tank. Well, that's odd. When did they come out of the, when did they take that solution out? At the beginning, at the end. It's like, well, I was at the end. Like, well, that's odd. You would expect the, because the tanks drain like from, from the bottom typically, right. which means the denser solution, higher concentration solution is usually the first to come out. Right. Well, it was odd that that would, why those four or five bottles? I forget the exact number. I think it was four, maybe five, of dark green solution. And so we started poking around. That's, and they were all, I mean, there were lots of bottles, right? And so we went back into the um, uh, facility manager's office and started asking questions. We wanted to know where those solutions came from, why those bottles uh, were higher in concentration, what the concentration was, yada, yada, yada. And basically, we were, we were on the beginning, end, beginning of the discovery of this, this, what really was a near miss. It was and after the fact and you may have heard this already. What happened was, was operators acting on the back shift. They had an approved procedure and approved analysis to drain a tank. And they, and they did that draining, and that's what filled up most of the bottles. Well, they had the pumps running, they had, they were back there, they wanted to continue on. They wanted to get rid of more solutions. They wanted to drain more tanks. Remember, there was an incentive to do all this. There's money on the line to drain tanks quicker, right? And so, without anybody's approval, without any uh, safety analysis, without having any idea what the uh, solutions were in this next tank, they decided on their own, these operators did, to go drain this other tank. And they did. And sure enough, that's what came out with the higher concentration solution. They realized that it was higher concentration solution and decided to cover it up because it's, you know, one's dark green, the rest are it's pretty obvious, right? So they decided to start blending and they blended some of the material in the various bottles to try to make it look like the same material. And all this was known. They deliberately did it. And then management, the, the on the floor supervisors at the time, participated in the cover-up and they decided not to tell anybody that they drained this other tank and that they did this blending operation. Um, and all that came to light whenever we were just asking the kinds of questions like, well, how come this material is higher in concentration? Where did it come from? Yada, yada, yada. And that eventually triggered the truth coming out. Now, 
as, I mean, and that is the setup. That's exactly what we were predicting was going to happen. We were saying the operators had completely disregarded, were in a, a culture that was willing to completely disregard procedures, were willing to do whatever it took to, to drain tanks quicker, they were more concerned about environment, they were more concerned about their performance incentives, they had decided criticality couldn't happen, uh, and that they would do this kind of stuff, exactly. And we were fortunate that they ran out of solution in that other tank. The only reason that they didn't have a criticality accident was because the other tank ran empty first. Just didn't provide enough solution. There was the right concentration. Had they filled up three more bottles, we had a criticality accident. And the only reason it didn't happen is because they ran out of solution. And they didn't know that. They had no idea. They were just, the operator at the time, uh, falsely, the operators, somehow or other had gotten the impression that four liter bottles, these jugs, you know, it contains about a gallon of solution, were safe by geometry and that any number of them stacked up or drained would be safe. Truth of the matter is eight, roughly eight of those bottles set on the table here would have achieved critical, critical and they would have died. That was the, uh, so that happened in September 1994. And was that EG&G was contract? That was EG and G. That was EG and G. So, um, okay. So the criticality. Would, so the the bottles, the dark bottles, had come from the white bottles were from one tank, and the yep. dark bottles were from another tank. Correct. And then were, they and were mixing, but they obviously didn't get it enough. Enough. To right. To see. Right. So they poured. So the light right. bottles that you saw had had some of the dark stuff poured in. Right. Right. About again, it was about. I think they drained about two bottles worth out of the unauthorized tank and then in their blending process made about four or five more bottles of in-between concentration solution, which is a very dangerous thing to be doing because they had no idea what they were they blending. Did, I assume they're doing this in a glove box. In a glove box, right, yeah. right. And a funnel or something, pouring it from bottle to bottle? Yeah, just, you know, it's just what you'd think of in your yeah. kitchen. <laughs> It's not very, not very sophisticated at all. <laughs> and so the bottles were all sitting together in oh, the yeah. glove box. Oh, yeah, just sitting there. Yes, back. yes. And as a criticality kind of person, you're, you're sitting there wondering, uh, wow, when you back, you start thinking back, because a human body is a, is a, a big bag of water, right? Well, you're a, ref, you're a walking reflector and moderator of neutrons. And if we were thinking, wow, we, I hope, hope the system wasn't real close to being critical, because just by walking up to it, a human body could add enough reflection and moderation to cause it to go critical. Really? Yeah. So did you guys skedaddle out of well, there? Well, did, we, we, we didn't linger once we started <laughs> asking questions. That's the truth of the matter. I mean, once we realized it just didn't, didn't look right. And were those people fired or disciplined? Yeah, to at least some of them were fired. I forget the exact numbers. At least one or two were fired uh, from the site. So it's not considered criminal negligence, though. Uh, well, they, I don't think they were ever, no, I don't think so, no. Um, but see, and they were put in a position where management created that. That was the, that my whole issue, you know, I was a manager for eg and and I was telling senior management, you've created a management culture where your employees are, you are setting the, the, um, the plant, the operators only responded to the management culture they were put in. It wasn't really, I mean, yeah, they made these decisions and they made the decision to cover it up. But the truth of the matter is management put them in the position where they felt it was in their best interest to go drain that other tank. And an operator never says, I mean, a human never says, I think I'm going to go take a risk of killing myself in a criticality accident, right? I mean, nobody's going to do that. Um, so the fact that they, were, they felt somehow that it was in their interest to go drain this tank in this unauthorized way is a management problem. And, um, and they weren't listening. So was the management also rebuffed after or disciplined, anything like that? I don't think so, no. Other than the fact that EG&G, &G, of course, left yeah. uh, in the next couple of years, didn't get the contract, Kaiser Hill came in. But the individuals involved, I don't think there were, I don't recall too, many, too much of a management shakeup. Um, why don't you tell me a, a little bit about your job arc through Rocky Flats? You said you started out in the... In the started out in the critical, critical mass laboratory mm -hmm. uh, doing uh, critical experiments 
to, and our job was to, to make a system critical to calculate and analyze um, that system mm -hmm. using a series of computer codes to make sure that we got the right answer. Because the nice thing about being exactly critical is you know it's there, you know it's one. That's why we was telling you we wanted it to be exactly 1.0. Mm -hmm. Because these uh, criticality safety codes purpose are to calculate something called K effective. It's the reacti called the reactivity of the system, which is this magic number called K effective. And when a system is exactly critical, that number is one. Mm -hmm. And so if you, if you made a system that you can measure was exactly one, and then use your code to calculate it, it ought to give you one as well. If it doesn't, there's a problem with the code. And if there's problems with the code, we need to go fix it because those codes are the ones that the safety people are using to analyze the system in the plant, you know, the, the stuff on the system or in the tanks. And the, of course, their job is to keep it way below one, right? right. Um, so that was my job. So we ran a bunch of experiments, and I did that from 1983 through 1985. I left uh, the critical mass laboratory uh, 1985 and became a criticality safety engineer. Uh, so I was quit doing research mm -hmm. and I started doing this analysis on the operating systems in the plant from in 1985. So we then walked through the buildings? That's what I was in the buildings all the time. Primarily I was I was working in building 707 which was the, is that bothering you? Um, hey Vicki, yeah. could you turn down the TV please? I mean, I think it's fine because we have the lapel mic, but okay. I would hate for all this. Yeah, remember all this background. Yeah. Uh, so I worked primarily in seven in the metal uh, areas as a criticality safety engineer. The stuff actually making the, the pits. Um, I, mean, I did that until 1987. 1987, I transferred to a group called Safeguards Measurements. The per Safeguards Measurements group's job was to measure and track all the plutonium on the site. And we ran the uh, physics equipment, the physics counters, to uh, calculate, measure how much plutonium is in any kinds of package. And my, doing my graduate research, um, I, I was very good at neutron detectors. And so I kind of took over the, um, what's called the passive active neutron crate counter and the passive active neutron drum counter. Became the neutron assay guru for the site in 1987. Um, and then in 1989, I took my first management job in May 1989. In June 6, 1989, the FBI raided. So I had been a manager less than a month, and the FBI raids. <laughs> then that same summer, um, Jim Stone uh, goes public with his allegations that there have been cover-ups of criticality accidents, and there were critical dunes of plutonium in the duct work at Rocky Flats. Well, my group's job was to measure plutonium wherever it was. So I got involved in, in the aftermath of plutonium in the ducts. Then in 1990, I left Safeguard's measurements management job and went back to criticality engineering um, to be an advisor to the new nuclear safety director uh, that would just transfer it in from eg and because eg and had just taken over the contract. And in very short order, they asked me to be the criticality safety engineering manager. And basically, I was the criticality safety manager from 1990 through 94, whenever I left eg and And then I stayed on as a consultant to the Department of Energy from 94 through 96, whenever I became a, a DOE employee. Well, that's where I'm at now. And so as a consultant to DOE, were you in D.C. or were you still? No, I was still at Rocky Flats. I was in. I did not leave Rocky Flats until June 1997. And um, so that's when the, the near miss happened. Was you were a consultant, so were you on site all the time? Oh yeah. But you weren't working for the contractor. You were right. Overseeing the I was overseeing the contractor. Right. But uh, remember the timing. I I left and I resigned in August 1994 mm -hmm. because I was telling the site you're going to have a criticality and I can't. I and I actually have. I think they granted me whistleblower status in the aftermath of this because it was all in writing to, to management. These are all the problems we're seeing. And uh, less than two months later, it happened. Uh, so I was like, wow, 
I thought it was happen soon, but two months was pretty quick. <laughs> well, it's great that you were. Uh, it's good that it, right yeah, and it was a good thing that it actually didn't go critical. Of course. Yeah. I mean, if it was, and that lesson then then that's why that videotape was made actually because that's we said well listen we've got to drive this message back into this site that a criticality accident can still happen here. That's why this one's called it can happen here and I'm on that video too um, but that's why we made that video and we trained all the employees that was one of the corrective actions DOE I help I helping DOE uh, drove down through the site was to get everybody re-indoctrinated to that. You think it worked? Yeah well the, obviously the plants closed down and we got through it without any accidents so that was the last one that was even remotely close. Um, as a whistleblower, or whistleblower status, I mean, were you, did you feel that you were in any way, um, not threatened, but, uh, what's the word? And were you, um, were there any punitive things that happened when you started complaining, or people just weren't listening to you? No, in fact, what's so funny is, in a sick sort of way, is after my last attempt to get my management's attention. You know, I wrote up another white paper listing all my concern and my staff's concern. And it was a bunch of us signed this. My, my boss comes out and says, well, if you're that disgruntled, I just quit. And so I did. <laughs> and it was only after the, the near miss happened that they decided that, that there was somebody out there trying to, to warn them that they were ignoring it. And so I was already gone, you yeah. know. Uh, from the contractor by then. So did your boss say that um, sort of I'm sick of hearing from you, I don't want to, like, nothing's going to happen? Yeah, that was basically the, the message, yep. And that was because it just wasn't a concern of theirs, they, they were more concerned with the spills? Again, I think, I think everybody was believing we were crying wolf. That you know, we were saying that uh, there were safety problems and they just didn't believe it. They just didn't believe it was that bad. And senior management had their deadlines and had their perspective. Their answer to me was, well, get your staff out there and, if, and look for problems, and if you see problems, tell them to stop. But remember, my staff's job was to produce the analyses to allow production to keep on going, what we, production, allow the operations to keep going. They were already understaffed. We were already understaffed for that mission and far overworked on that mission. We didn't have time to tell my staff to go out there and look over operations shoulder all the time and uh, so they were just blowing us off. Did you think that, um, I, was there some, a sense that after the FBI raid people got so obsessed with safety and or with the sort of community view of safety and environmental issues that people, that everybody, were, do people feel that other people were being paranoid about stuff and that's why they were blowing it off or I mean you would think that so much attention to safety that after the raid? Well, again, remember I told you the culture changed. Yeah. From 1990 to 92, that was the culture. Everybody was safety, safety, safety. In fact, we were never safe enough from right. 1990 to 92 because we were going to get safe enough to go back into pit production to start producing again, right? Mm -hmm. So in the big picture scheme of things, people were still accusing us of not being safe enough, although they were, we were, had ramped up safety tremendously from 1990 to 93 time frame. Mm -hmm. Well then whenever it, the, the decision to just close the plant came about they thought it, it was like the, the external environment went Phew, we don't have to do that anymore we just got to clean up and close up. We don't need to do that. That was overkill. That was over conservative. We can now let's get let's 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 hurry up and get this place cleaned up and closed down. So we don't need to do that anymore because we're not going to try to operate. We're just going to clean up. So we don't need to do all that safety anymore, see? So it changed. And that's what we were trying to say. Look, you know, all of that, all the focus in the, re the resumption days was on the metal buildings. Uh, we did res officially get building 559, the analytical laboratory, and building 707, the PU metal facility, resumed, if you will and then the plant shut down and we quit worrying about it. But during those resumption days, the improvements in safety really only happened in those two facilities. Yeah. There was not enough resources to make those same safety culture changes 
in the other facilities in parallel. It was just way too expensive. Uh, and so then they said, okay, fine. Now let's turn our attention to cleaning up Building 771. Let's build, clean it up quickly. But they hadn't invested in the safety culture in Building 771, the same way they had in Building 707 and Building 559. So it wasn't there. Okay, I'm stop you. Are we out of, did I already talk and We're recording. Um, this is Jerry McCamey. It's the 11th of January, 2004. I'm Hannah Nordhaus, and we're at Jerry's house in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Um, so we were just talking about criticalities and colorimetry. <laughs> colorimetry, yes. We were just talking about how experienced chemical operators could tell you just by the color of the plutonium nitrate solution pretty closely what the concentration was. Um, you know, I only knew enough to know that darker was, was higher in concentration than lighter ones. That's all I knew. That was enough. Yeah. Okay, um, why don't we um, talk about, why don't we talk about sort of the, the major incidents that we were just saying we hadn't gotten to, and then I'll ask some more general questions about okay. Rocky Flats. Um, take your pick, I guess, uh, plutonium in the ducts or the raid? Uh, I'll touch on the raid and then go quickly to plutonium in the ducts. Okay. Um, when the, the raid happened, I was in a group called Safeguards Measurements. Uh, my job then was to uh, measure plutonium in uh, packages and uh, cans and drums, crates, wherever it was, to keep track of it. The reason we wanted to keep track of it is so that we would know that the terrorists, for example, weren't getting it, so that it wasn't going off site. Mm -hmm. Our job was to keep plutonium out of the hands of bad guys. And if we knew where all the plutonium was, it was obvious it wasn't going anywhere near bad guys. I was in a, in a bigger group called Nuclear Material Safeguards. Again, one of the things we worried about was bad guys getting into the site somehow and getting access to plutonium, right? That's all prefaced to this is that on the day the FBI raids, there's FBI guys going into plutonium areas with guns. I mean, you're allowing people, armed people, near plutonium, and it was our job to prevent anybody like that from ever getting access. You know, it was just unreal. It was just felt unreal that all of a sudden these guys, these FBI agents, with guns could go roaming, roaming around these nuclear materials that we were protecting so well. And it was just, uh, it's like, how you know these guys aren't bad guys? They had badges. They had badges. <laughs> we were told to do whatever, you know. Uh, boy, they caught the, the day, it never changed. The, or, it was never the same after June 6, 1989. I mean, I remember it. It was uh, D-Day, by the way. It happened on D-Day, the anniversary of D-Day, June 6, 1989. So what, um, t tell me, like, oh. sort of blow by blow, where were you when it happened? Were you, it was before work, it came very early? Or? It came early, um, during the work day. In the aftermath, this is what, I, during, when, at least my perception was, again, I was in safeguard, so I only knew this had happened. I knew that, that that the FBI had raided and that these people were running around with guns and we had orders to cooperate with them. I wasn't, my job wasn't so much involved with the environmental piece, so I didn't interact with them too much. Uh, it was just that when you, when you work at a site who's has a defense mission, it's highly classified, highly secret, and you're trying to keep people from knowing too much, it just feels very strange to have your site invaded by a bunch of people. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention, and you probably heard this over and over again, one of the neat things about working at Rocky Flats in that period was everybody who went to work there felt we were contributing to national security. Everybody felt we understood what the mission was, everybody bought into that mission, everybody thought we were contributing. And then how these guys come in, it was, it was uh, like heresy, you know? <laughs> and, and the plant just never recovered. I mean, it was just the day things totally changed at Rocky Flats. So heresy because um, suddenly you were the bad guys? We were the bad guys, right. Right. You know? And then, then it got later, I mean, it gets to the point where later, 
in uh, public meetings like for resumption because there was a whole bunch of public meetings on being able to restart the plant. I mean, the people who were scared of the plant uh, took it out on, on us as individuals. I mean, we were, I, I was on panels where we were all accused of being baby killers and being mindless scientists who would kill whoever just because we got paid to do it. And it's like, well, you know, that's, you just, you smile and you try to explain yourself, but that's kind of a hard thing to take when you think about it. <laughs> did, you, um, did you feel that, uh, I just had to make you feel this? It just that the people didn't understand, and, you know, they, they were just reacting emotionally because they were scared. Um, but in my mind, they were so closely correlated because uh, July, July, June 6, 1989, the FBI raids, by August of that year, uh, Jim Stone had made his allegations about critical dunes of plutonium in the ventilation duct work and the cover-up of criticality accidents at Rocky Flats. So Admiral Watkins, who was the Secretary of Energy, sent a team in that became known as the Scientech team to investigate these allegations. And again, I was the manager of Safeguards Measurements at the time. And so when the team came to the site and says, well, we want to go find plutonium in the duct works, uh, who can help us measure it? And my group was the only one on site capable of doing that technically. So I volunteered to help out with that. And this is another sad tale in some sense. Um, the management's initial position was is there was no plutonium in the duct works officially. That was management's official early position, which was just flat out wrong. Uh, everybody who worked at the site knew there was plutonium at in the ducts. I mean, it was common knowledge. Um, Why did they do that then? The site management had a history of stonewalling. Uh, you know, this, this overarching thing of secrecy, this idea that we, you know, nobody from outside has a right to really meddle in our business. We'll tell you what you, you should know. I mean, that was the overarching philosophy and culture. And so they just thought they could do that again. They didn't realize the world had just changed. I mean, when you've got guys running around with guns in your fissile material areas, you can no longer just tell the rest of the world, we'll tell you what you want to know. And what's bad is they were telling, saying things that their own staff was trying to get the word to them that they were inaccurate. Uh, what is so bizarre is, is that just a few months prior to um, the Scientech team getting there, um, I and my staff had been looking for some plutonium in places. Um, and we started finding all these elevated readings, and guess what? The duct works, right? And they were significantly elevated. I mean, lots of grams of plutonium in piping. Lots of grams in lots of locations. So I tried to get people interested. I tried to get radiation protection in interested. Like, or do you care about the fact that there's Lots of grams of plutonium in the ductwork. And the answer was no. We, the reason their answer was no is because they're routinely monitoring radiation levels at the worker level, and those are within limits, and so they didn't care. Okay, so they didn't care. So you, I went back to my criticality safety buddies and said, do you care that there's plutonium in, in all these pipes? And the answer was no. We've analyzed the pipes. Pipes are the right diameter. You can't go critical as long as it's in these diameter pipes. Okay, well, that's a reasonable answer. I can, I can buy that. I went to my safeguards management people and says, uh, our job is to count plutonium and to figure out where it is. Do we care that there's lots of grams in, in the duct work? And their management's issue was, no, uh, the DOE orders don't allow us to put that on the books and write that off, so we don't care either. And then lo and behold, you know, there's allegations of plutonium in the duct works. And then management's first position, first position is, we know there's none in there because because we have inventory records and we control everything uh, to within a certain balances. We balance our books, right? That's just like a bank account, right? And it's like, that is absolutely the wrong answer to give. I and mean, it's just totally wrong because those books are balanced based upon the threat levels of people trying to steal things, right? Uh -huh. They're not, they weren't set up to control kinds of levels that would prevent criticality. Uh, a minimum critical mass in the right geometry is only 450 grams of plutonium. That's very little. 
Now, it's, granted, that's dispersed in solution, and it's a pretty big sphere at that point, but that's very little. Safeguards never controlled the inventory to 450 grams anywhere. So to go on record officially early on with the Scientech team that we know we don't have a criticality problem with plutonium in the ducts because we control our inventory was just technically indefensible. Those are they balanced their books, but they didn't have a book for this. Basically. We didn't have a book at that level. Yeah. The, the books were balanced against people stealing it in bomb quantities at any one time. Yeah, I don't want to go there. <laughs> I don't want to go there. <laughs> uh, but, but that's, so it was a different animal. I mean, the safeguards controls were set up to prevent people from stealing enough of the right kinds of plutonium so that they could go make a weapon out of it. Mm -hmm. That was the reason for safe nuclear material safeguards. Criticality's job was to prevent a, a little bit of material getting in the wrong configuration and causing a criticality. The two weren't meeting. I mean, they weren't, their controls weren't the same. And management tried to just stonewall again and just, of course, technically it was indefensible and outside folks quickly shot holes in that and then management continued to stonewall and so management got tossed out. Rockwell was the original management team when all this happened, Rockwell International. They didn't last very long in that environment, right? Yeah. <laughs> they were gone by 1990. And this all happened in late 1989. But I was a Rockwell manager, and uh, I volunteered. Nobody at the site, by the way, had ever gone on a systematic program of measuring the plutonium in the ducts, because obviously nobody cared, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the Scientech team came out, and sure enough, with my staff's equipment and help, we found six kilograms in just one pipe alone. That's a lot. Yeah, in just one pipe. And it wasn't it, because of the, of the, of the diameter, and there was no water in the pipe, and the pipe was small diameter, so it couldn't go critical. But it, again, it didn't take any, everybody knew that pipe had plutonium in it. And when you think about it, think about how Rocky Flats was built. One of the things they advertised was is that they had HEPA filters, right, on all the ventilation stacks. The purpose of HEPA filters is to keep plutonium from getting into the environment. Well, duh, why would I have to have two stages of HEPA filters on the back end if there wasn't plutonium in the ducts? I mean, it was just a stupid management position to take, you know, to posture yourself as, you know, we don't have a problem. Of course there's plutonium in the ducts. The issue is how much is it and is it a problem? Well, the good news was is that, or the bad news was is I got a charter to go measure this. And I, I was a young manager and I've always had the idea that, you know, I'll go help the plant and, and we'll go do it if we can technically do it. And I had 10 guys, that's how many people we had. And we volunteered to go measure the plutonium in the ducts. And so in the first three months at Rocky Flats doing this in the fall 1989, we measured all of the large amounts of plutonium because it was obvious where it was. We could identify the kind of operations that would tend to produce lots of dust. We could, it was the uh, uh, kinds of operations that put, you know, the grinding metal things or things that made fumes that went, goes into the air. So it was just talk to operators, what kinds of operations do this? And that's where you go look. And it's just like, uh, um, there's nothing more complex than, than uh, snow drifts. Where do you look for snow drifts? Where, what causes snow to drift, right? It's just a fence that breaks the airflow that causes a little turbulence and the stuff drifts behind the brakes. So all you do is you look at a pipe and you say, well, if I have air flowing into a pipe, where, what breaks the, the smooth flow? It bends, right? Flanges. So all we did was we, we went and looked at every elbow and in every flange and we started finding lots of kilograms. And our first measurement campaign was to put an upper bound on the amount of plutonium in the ducts. Uh, I, to come up with a number it could not be higher than because the concern was safety. So we wanted the largest possible number. And that number, as I recall, was somewhere around 60 kilograms. That's a lot of plutonium in the ductwork. And so we did. And we reported that to management. And that came out in the press accidentally with the new EG&G regime in January of 1990. It was like in a press conference, you know, with the new EG&G management. Well, how much is in there? And somebody said something like that number and just kind of an off-the-cuff remark. And so in the Denver media, 
you know, Rocky Flats lo has lost however many bombs worth of plutonium in the duct, right? Now remember, I've just been a little young, I'm a young manager at the site, I've only been a manager six months, and my phone rings one morning coming into work and says, guess what, we're going to go see the governor today. We're going to go see who? We're going to go see the governor, Roy Romer at the time. The reason is, is because it just hit the press that there's 60 kilograms of plutonium in the ductwork and he wants to know why and what's the implications. And so I and the new EG&G president and the DOE plant manager go running off downtown to meet with the governor's staff. We didn't actually meet the governor and explaining, because I was the only one that knew where it was, I and my staff. And so I had a little career now in, in measuring plutonium in the ducts. And then it became kind of a road show after that because now it was, cr it was crucial to resuming operations that we quantified where all the plutonium was and that we controlled it in the future. And so we had this little dog and pony show was is that where I'd go and give a public presentation on where all the plutonium was, how much it was, and how I knew what it was. And then another fellow would come along behind us and say why it wasn't a criticality safety problem and then another guy would come along and explain how we were going to clean out the ducts. And so we gave that little, we met with the public a lot, we met with press, we met, gave out a lot of interviews uh, along that lines. But was, in some ways it was fun, uh, technically we did our jobs. Uh, technically we were right. And, and what's even funnier is early on management didn't even want to believe our measurements. The, um, again, you know how some people were saying we, did, we weren't right because we weren't measuring enough. Well, then there was the other side of management saying, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. There's, not enough, there's no plutonium in the ducts. And we were saying, we were using radiation instrumentation and measuring it. And we were saying, we know it's there and we know exactly where it is. And we made, we made a map, you know, like a little road map, externally looking into this pipe. You know, it's a closed pipe. And we said, we, it, it starts there, and it starts building up, and by here you've got so many grams, and it's built up, and the biggest deposit's right there. And sure enough, uh, a few months later, uh, we got the capability to put a, a video, you know, one of these little um, flexible cameras into the pipe. And remember, management's position was this doesn't exist. You, you're all wrong. It can't be that high. And so they started fishing the fishing the little video camera in and they made a videotape inside the duct that we had measured the pipe. I mean, it's a pipe, right? It's an eight inch pipe, it gets bigger. And they were measuring where the little camera was. So you're kind of coming down this pipe and they could tell you exactly where it is. And lo and behold, at the exact place where we said that's where it begins, there was a stain in the pipe. And then the stain grew into a deposit. And where we said it's the biggest, the camera showed it was completely sealed, almost completely sealed. It looked like a big hardening of the artery, you know. It was like dust, is that what it was? Well, it was more like uh, ceramic uh, clay really? because this was an aqueous, and so it started out as a red stain on the inside of this pipe, right, it's where it began. And by the end it was clogged, so it was like all seized up and clogged with just a little hole for the ventilation, and it looked like hardening of the arteries, arthrosclerosis, you know, that you see. But it was all hard, it was very hard material and it was like uh, all caked up. And that was the first time everybody believed, I mean really believed that everything we were measuring was true. And we didn't have any problem from management after that. <laughs> so how did it get in there? It's part of the process. Um, all the glove, box are op glove boxes are operated at negative pressure uh -huh. um, because the idea is that if you lose glove box integrity you want, you want the wind blowing into the glove box so that plutonium doesn't go out on the persons. Right. And so in order to create this negative pressure, you have to put fans on the back end and, and withdraw air, circulate air out of the, mm -hmm. and so that's all it was. And so there was a constant airflow into the glove box, exhausting the glove box to create this negative pressure. And so if you put any particulates in the air, any va liquid vapors, any metal or dusty things, it just gets sucked right along into the pipes. Now there were pre-filters on the boxes, those were famous at the time because people would puncture holes. There were stories about operators punk poking holes in the pre-filters because 
they would get so clogged with plutonium that they couldn't maintain the negative pressure. If you can't maintain the negative pressure, you can't operate. If you can't operate, you miss your production schedules. Mm -hmm. So rather than take the time to change out the filters and delay production, they just poked holes in it. And of course that puts more plutonium in the ducts, which puts more plutonium up in the HEPAs, et cetera. So it's not good. That's a bad practice. <laughs> so why, so I mean, if, if the system was sort of meant to work that way, yep. why were people surprised that? Again, that's what, that's what just boggles the mind. The plant was designed knowing that there was going to be plutonium in, in the ventilation piping. I mean, obviously anybody designed such a system I mean, you know that's what's going to happen. That's why we just couldn't believe management would take the position, the public, you know, position that we don't have a problem. And we know we don't have a problem because, I mean, it was just technically indefensible. Right. And again, I think it was because of this culture of stonewalling, this culture of isolation, this culture of um, nobody has a right to question what we do here. Um, and that's, in that culture, they, Rocky Flats came out of that culture kicking and screaming, you know. Yeah. They had to be dragged out of that culture. Um, it, was, it was just wrong. They should have never done that. If they had just talked and listened to their staff, they would have been able to give the right answer right off the bat, and I think it would have gone much better for them. Was uh, plutonium in the ducts, was it a problem? I mean, what the kind of risk did it pose? The, the, if, if, the initial hysteria was over criticality safety. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the, se that's a sexy thing to shut a plant down with is criticality safety for all the things we've talked about in the past. I mean, people die in criticality accidents, right? It takes very little material under the absolute right circumstances to cause a criticality problem. Um, and the fact that criticality safety engineers weren't analyzing this, it wasn't being measured, uh, it just added this overall impression that the site was out of control. Mm -hmm. uh, in reality, the criticality safety risk from this material is exceedingly small because there was no water in the pipes. The pipes were, had defined geometries. Um, it would take some kind of ridiculous cataclysmic accident to cause a criticality accident to the material. And later, analyses were accepted that showed that. I mean, the initial position was that it's not, we can't cause a credible criticality accident with this material. And that's the right answer. However, remember going back to our fire issue? Mm -hmm. That material was not considered in the fire analysis because it was, nobody had it quantified. And so that's where the real risk was, is something called the material at risk uh, for these, bu these buildings. And you want to know how much plutonium you have stored in a facility when you're analyzing these maximum uh, kinds of accidents, like in case you have a massive fire or a massive wind event that tears the facility down, mm -hmm. you want to know how much plutonium could potentially become dispersed in the air. And if you're ignoring tens of kilograms of already dusty plutonium in the ducts, which is already in a form that's amenable to be dispersed, because some of it we found later was quite fluffy, I mean quite powdery, and the aqueous watery areas it tended to be crusty, but in 707 it was fine powder, real nice light, could be blown by just, you could see the airflow. If you disturbed it, you know, stirred it with a little camera, you could see it poof and flow uphill a little more. Uh, and so that was a safety problem. And then in the end, the good news it was um, we ended up contributing to the closure of Rocky Flats, because the only way you can tear a building down is if you know you've got it all, right? And the only way you can tear it down safely is if you know you've got it all, you know where it is. And so by developing that technology in 1990, which we did, it enabled the plant to actually shut down later on schedule because the group that was in charge of characterizing the facility so that they'd know it was clean enough was the same group I trained up and with the equipment we put in place for measuring plutonium in the ducts. And that became a crucial uh, group for able to close the plant on time and safely. So that was so that the little snaking camera was that a, that was that something you developed? No, the little the visual thing was uh, was the people that were going to do clean out later on. They would actually do these techniques where they would either go in and take the whole pipe down or go in remotely and then vacuum clean the pipes. So all that was was just a visual verification of what I was 
our staff used gamma ray detectors. And we were measuring the gamma rays coming from the plutonium. And from those gamma ray signatures, we could tell you how much, how many grams there were. We made some assumptions about shape and deposits, how it would lie in the pipe, but they're pretty common sense. You'd, you know, you got a cylindrical pipe that's going to lie in the bottom, and you can make some pretty easy physics calculations that tells you based upon this number of gamma rays coming from this kind of plutonium, if I see this count rate at this time, how many grams that relates to. My staff measured gamma rays. And so we, and they still do, still did. And we could measure how many grams were in any pipe, for example, uh, to within about 25% accuracy. So you guys, were, so you're walking under the, underneath the pipes or like, you know, holding it up to yep. along the wall yep. for the ductus yep. or something like that? Yep, In fact, we made little t-shirts. We celebrated our first campaign and we were called McCamey's Monkeys because <laughs> some of the pipes are hard to reach. They were, you know, these, these are, in some ways hideous old buildings. I mean, there's pipes everywhere, and there's ventilation pipes that do all kinds of crazy things. They go through walls, and they, they jump levels, and they curly cue around all in the upstairs. Mm -hmm. and, and in that first campaign, my staff was literally climbing on top of glove boxes with handheld radiation meters and, and hanging from pipes and standing on pipes to measure other pipes. And we put little barcode labels everywhere we made a measurement. So after we were done, you could see every spot we measured, and we had all that cataloged, and we knew where every one of those things were. But yeah, they were, climb they were literally climbing around pipes wow. with, with a handheld instrument. And, um, and those, things, those kinds of measurements were crucial to, uh, for us to resume, and then ultimately being crucial to being able to close the plant. Because again, remember, up until my group did it, there was no capability to site. So had that not happened, they would have decided to close the plant in the 93, 92 time frame, right? And had to start from scratch. Oh, how are we going to measure all this? And how are we, as it was, whenever it came time to start closing the site, the technology already existed, staff was already in place, the methods were already there. So I felt good about that. The docs, uh, they didn't end up cleaning them. This was initially a resumption. Yes, thing. so the idea was to clean out the ducts in place. And then, and then monitor the buildup and then keep it underneath 400 grams because remember that magical number for criticality. Right. And now in the end, what they did was they just used the numbers to determine how they were going to package the pipes and cut them out. So they didn't clean the pipes out, they just took the pipes out because they were not going to run the facility. But that's useful because there's criticality safety limits on how much you can put in a particular box or a crate or a drum. And so when they were cutting the pipes out, you'd want to know, in this length of pipe, there's this much plutonium. Therefore, we can take this length of pipe out safely, and we'll go in that pipe or that drum or that crate. So it, that's all very useful. Mm -hmm. And at the end, in order to take a building down, I mean, to rubbleize a building, you needed to have it essentially clean. And so you have to be able to go through and measure it and show that there's nothing above background in the plant. Um. Oh, I actually, no, well, when you're talking about the buildings, I want to ask you some buildings questions. But I think you just go back and finish up this FBI raid and, and plutonium in the ducks. Stone and plutonium. stone, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thing. Um, I guess my first question is: Do you think that um, the FBI raid did they? Ha a lot of people have said that they didn't think they had any valid. You know, ultimately, it was proved that none of the accusations were real, were right or true. Did, did the FBI have reason to go in there? Do you think, and was it a good thing in any way that it happened? You always have to ask the people what perspective they're applying when they give you those answers, right? Yeah. They either is no no problem answer or or it was a problem answer, and I won't an, an, see. I think the folks that say it was never an issue and yay, you know, it was no big deal. I think they're speaking it from a legal sense mm -hmm. or from a, an acute death kind of sense. You know what I'm saying? In those terms, yeah, there was probably no illegalities or, and certainly no one died mm -hmm. from what happened. I mean, no one died in the short term, acutely, right? Mm -hmm. That does not say that there were good environmental practices through the life cycle. The plant does not say that there was not groundwater and ground contamination and, and very poor practices in terms of protecting the environment and the system that you lived in. Um, I don't, personally, 
I think the FBI raid was overkill. But it wasn't because there wasn't something there. It was just the way that the administration chose to handle that particular issue. Mm -hmm. um, however, I, I think it was perfectly appropriate to ask questions about and question the long-term practices of how the site dealt as an environmental steward. Mm -hmm. I mean, clearly, I mean, the, the, that was one of the other big picture things I always I wanted to make sure we say, and other people may have said it too, is that these plants were always a, an agent of national policy. That's all they were. So when the, the government decided on a certain kind of policy and certain kinds of priorities, these plants just reflect it. The environment reflected it there, the working environment, the culture, the management culture. The contractors were hired. The contractors only did what they, however they made money. They only did what they did because they would make money doing it. Mm -hmm. And so national policy wasn't to protect the environment. The national policy was to operate in secret and go make pits. And so the contractor did that. And that's wrong. I mean, not, it was wrong in the sense of where was the national policy to protect the environment and balance the risks. Uh, it was just a, a Cold War mentality of, you know, let's go, let's go build bombs uh, and we'll worry about the environment later because nobody's dying right now. I mean, that was fundamentally the philosophy. So these things always reflect all these whole systems, these whole th th infrastructures reflect national policy. And they're very ugly facilities, by the way. These, uh, they're ugly, hideous facilities. <laughs> they really are. <laughs> and I think that kind of reflects what their purpose is when you think about it, right? They're related to nuclear weapons. When you think about actually using nuclear weapons and what they're used for, I mean, it's a hideous device, right? How much more fitting that the sites and the plants that would give them birth are ugly things. I mean, they really are. They're dark. They're threatening. They're, it's, it's not pleasant. There's all kinds of health threats within the facilities themselves. Um, it's just not pleasant. That's all the, so all the ones we visit now, Oak Ridge, Hampton, Ugly. 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 Not a pretty one in the lot. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> they're all dark and hideous. They're concrete monoliths. Uh, the, the size and the scale is monstrous. I mean, some of the equipment's huge. I mean, multi-story, multi-room size pieces of equipment. And, I mean, they're, and plutonium and uranium manufacturing is a glorified steel plant. I mean, it's the same thing as steel, right? Mm -hmm. And so you can just imagine these big old steel plants, but just having to done, be done in the way of dealing with your radioactive materials. and. Uh, it's just not pretty. And sometimes the uh, government would, would invest large sums of money in, in specialized equipment to make a special product, a, a one time only or a few kinds of a certain kind of weapons component. Make that one series and then throw it all away. And so there, within the Department of Energy, there's graveyards of essentially brand new pieces of manufacturing equipment because it was only purchased to do one thing. It did its one thing and now it's just in a, like an elephant graveyard of old equipment. It's there, just massive. Is there, are they all over the places graveyards or they're on the sites? They're on the sites. They're all on the sites because they're all, most of them are potentially contaminated, but it's just vast quantities. I mean, vast buildings. Remember that scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark? The first one where they, they, haul, they haul the lost ark off into a crate and it's buried in this government oh, thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the same way in these nuclear facilities. There's massive buildings with all kinds of stuff stored in them that was used once, done, and put in a, in a warehouse somewhere. Disposable. Disposable. And I was walking through looking at all that in the last year or so and I was thinking, well, what this really is is the uh, it's just like the weapons of the Cold War that are no longer needed, because that's what those were. I mean, they, they were, they were a, an expression of national policy to defeat a Cold War enemy. It was used, done, and now it has no purpose anymore. So it's just discarded. But that's what this is. It's the boneyards of the, of the Cold War, you know. Yeah. But it is ugly.
And I thought, how fitting, because nuclear weapons themselves are ugly things when you think about what their purpose is. And they're, they are made in ugly, unesthetically pleasing facilities. <laughs> um, well, I, I guess we'll, let's keep talking about the building then, since that's, okay. that's where we are. Okay. Um, and then I mean, I'll come back to Jim, Jim's talk, right? Like, okay, yep. Um, you're obviously quite familiar with the buildings now. It, um, one of the, for this, this grant that we're hoping to get in 10 days, um, one of the things that they were interested in knowing is sort of how the buildings change that the as bills wouldn't show, or you know, how, how it might have changed to reflect the mission or a change in the mission. And um, so if you're handed a blueprint of a building that was built in 1957 or something, would it be the same now when they're taking it apart? No. No, the, the, no the, <laughs> the blueprints had almost no correlation to what the facility really was. That was one of the real problems uh, in, in operating the facility safely you know, and showing how you knew you could operate it safely was is that the, the, blue, the blueprints the ad, did not match what we call the as-built. I mean, you'd go in the facility and say, where did this go? And it's supposed to be here. Well, there's no pipe there. There's no electrical conduit. There's, it, was, it was designed. Everything was done. Um, the plants were operated through most of their era as state of the craft, word of mouth, oral history kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And so the expertise, the history, the configuration management that we call, what we would call your engineering design basis was all in people's heads. And that's it. And so no, the, the, the actual on paper stuff didn't match at all. And now, now you go back to me and my role as a criticality safety guy. My job was to make sure that the solutions didn't go to the wrong places. And in building 771, it was such a jury-rigged system, there had been so many ad hoc modifications made through the year that you could, put, you could move solution from any place in that facility to any other place in that facility, essentially. There was no, nothing safe from plutonium solution in that facility. It could go anywhere. Just didn't know what was you didn't know where it was. It was amazing, uh, amazingly complex valve lineup in the overhead. I mean, it's an industrial, you know, there's no false ceiling. It's just pipe runs. It was just pipes everywhere. And it's dark, and there's valves, and there's, you know, and there's no, no labeling. Now, now, later on, they went through massive attempts to upgrade and trace and label. But, you know, early on, it was just Joe, Joe over here who's worked in the facility 20 years. He knows what to do. And he trains his apprentices, and they know what to do to get it from there to there. But that's how it was done through all those years. Uh, and as a criticality guy, knowing that if somebody messes something up and it goes from there to there instead of there to there, that could cause a criticality accident. It's scary. And so it tends to make you be very paranoid about what can go on, which is a good thing from a safety perspective. Yeah. I mean, a safety guy ought to be paranoid about what can go wrong. And uh, so that was. It was a scary facility from that standpoint. And so people, so the way that evolved is it's somewhat, some process changed. Some process working. changed and it was in a hurry, right? And we go back to this national policy thing again, right. right? The Department of Defense decides it needs some new kind of device to do some new kind of thing. Well, then, then that trickles down to somebody's got to go make that and meet those schedules that the Department of Defense wants for deployment. And it's, then the orders come down, let's jury rig this system up, let's make this scale up, let's make this, uh, this particular unit, this particular program, and then you're done. Then that program's done. Now that equipment's no longer needed. Now the, the new one's on board. So you just leave it there and you, and you try to cobble it up and then you go and make a new one. And so these things are just amazing hodgepodges of glove boxes. In fact, for building 771, one of the worries we had late in the game, and I don't know if you talked to Jack, y'all have interviewed Jack Weaver, but almost every kind of potentially fissile radioactive material in the universe was processed in 771 at one time or other, not just plutonium and uranium. And so some of that, because people were playing with what kinds of things could you put in a weapon, and so there was, all, there was uh, special areas in Building 771 that had all kinds of 
different isotopes in it. And one of the concerns was is that we would focus so much on plutonium and uranium, we'd lose sight of the fact that there was the potential to, to go discover other kinds of radioactive materials there. So we had an initiative later, late in the 90s, to go interview people with the oral histories <laughs> to find out what was processed where, because the only records were in their minds. You know, what was done in this room under this project? You know, where did that go? What could we, what else could we be looking for that could get us into trouble? If these walls could talk. If right? these walls could talk, <laughs> exactly. Uh, if I find anything out, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll <let you laughs> Well, obviously <laughs> now we, we, we went looking. The good news was we went looking and we didn't find any, any uh, significant quantities of anything else. But, you know, it was something we needed to go look for because it, these, these things were kind of kludges, jury rigs. I mean, it, like I said, it's not sophisticated. It's bucket chemistry. I mean, it's uh, just like you said, it's funnels and buckets and tubes and Tigon and, and it's just ugly and it's just sloppy. I mean, it's not much pristine. Now, if you go in the, in the metal areas where we're actually making the, the, um, the final end product units, those areas tended to be pretty neat. They could pretty those up pretty well because, mm -hmm. again, it's like dealing with, you know, individual items and you could put enough light in and those areas tend to be fairly pretty uh, as industrial areas go but the aqueous recovery buildings and those things in my view were, were just ugly I mean, you, we were going through them and you'd worry about things dripping on you and the thing that would be dripping on you would be plutonium nitrate <laughs> it wasn't on the floor but I mean it was like you know you'd watch what you were walking under because uh, the pipes leak. <laughs> so the stuff is moving through those pipes from room to room. Room to room, glove, glove box to glove box, so exactly. They move it to, they recover, you process one part of it and then move it somewhere else through a pipe right. to the next room where someone else would do something on it. Right. Wow. So there are a lot of pipes. There were lots of pipes. With lots of different kinds of things in it. I mean, it could be anything from clean nitric acid to water to dirty water to plutonium nitrate solution of various kinds. It could be waste solution, which means it's not a problem, or it could be the high concentrate because it's just everywhere. And then from a criticality perspective, then you had to know what was in what, what pipe and going where to make sure that it wasn't running too close to each other. Right. Too. Or it could go, end up in the wrong place and you end up in the wrong... Exactly. Okay. Right. Exactly. Wow. Right. And so, you know, that's one of the reasons why as crit engineers, we just spent a lot of time. One of the good pieces in those early days was there were very little restrictions on our ability to walk down areas. Mm -hmm. um, early in my career, if I wanted to go into building 771 or 707, I just got up and walked in. I put on a smock. I didn't even have to button it. A lab coat. I put on a white lab coat, put on a little pair of booties, and I wandered around. And in my free time, uh, when I wasn't just bit, I literally did that. I just go wander around. Why? I was looking for all that. I was looking for what could be where, what operations were really going on, and I'd just talk to the operators. I'd go talk to whoever. What are you doing? Why are you doing that? What do you do with that? Because the more you understood about that facility, and the only way to get it was through this oral tradition way, uh, the, the better able we were to keep it safe. So you just went around and asked questions? I just went around and asked questions, looked over people's shoulders. Just w whenever I found a door, I went through it. If it wasn't locked or forbidden, I just walked through it. Yeah, nowadays you can't do that because the security rules and the safety rules are so high, you can't just go on these. I, at, when those things first started hitting, I thought those were counterproductive to new safety guys uh -huh. understanding the system because it was so painful to actually go into the facility um, that you were actually trying to learn about. And the only way to learn about it was to be in it. So now they, just, they have to be accompanied by... You have to be on the plan of the day, you have to have a two-man rule, you have to have a, lots of anti cs you have to have check-in, check-out procedures. Yeah, it's a lot more cumbersome to go in and out of facilities. Um, but did I answer all your, enough of your question so, about yeah, facilities? I think so. Um, you talked about these processes going in and out now. I tell me sort of a typical day at your job. Oh, you mean now? No, at Rocky Flats. Oh, at Rocky Flats. Back then. Back then. You, you'd show up, you'd go to your office. You'd yep. Go, yeah. um, you, a criticality safety engineer's job is 
we spend some time in the office doing computer analysis of, of these systems, right? Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of the work was done with the operators themselves, asking them, what are you doing? How is the process supposed to work? What could go wrong in your process? What have you ever seen go wrong? What have you ever heard has gone wrong? If your job is to take something and go from here to here with it, and it's only those two items, how many times have you ever heard of anybody, instead of having two, have you ever heard of anybody doing four? Is it possible to do four? Could you do four? Why wouldn't you do four? And just you, spending time trying to figure out how bad could it get and uh, how bad has it ever gotten? Because our job, our job fundamentally was to analyze the worst possible case, the worst credible case, and make sure it was still subcritical. So our job was to anticipate everything that could go wrong, and then after it had gone wrong, it would still be safe. And so the only reason, as the ANSI standards say, um, a criticality accident never happened because somebody calculated a number wrong. It's because they failed to anticipate what could go wrong. And so a, critical, a good criticality safety engineer would spend a lot of time in the operating areas talking to operators and being in the facility. And, and later evolutions in the Department of Energy, we had to reiterate that fact. I mean, not at Rocky so much, but later on, mm -hmm. because it became cumbersome to get in the facility, it becomes easy just to go sit at a desk yeah. and ask for somebody to ship you a bunch of drawings and ship you a bunch of procedures. You just read the procedures and you read the drawings and you do some analysis based on that and that and that. And shoop. well, as we just discussed, rarely does the procedure and the drawing match what's really going on. And so you've got to be there. And so the departments uh, had a lot of initiatives to make sure criticality safety engineers spend time in the operating areas. And that's a modern day thing that we're still working on. But I loved that. That was actually a fun part of the job, just meandering around the facility. Because that's the only way you could learn what was going on. Um. I'll go back to Jim Stone real quick. Why, he said that there had been a criticality? Yep, he alleged that there had been a criticality and the site had covered it up. And that was not proven to be the case? No, it, all the data showed the opposite. Again, remember these fission products? Uh -huh. If you ever have an accidental criticality, you're going to make fission products. Just like a, as, when a nuclear weapon goes off, you make fission products that you can detect, like strontium and cesium, right? Uh -huh. And those things are not anything the plant would have used. So had there ever been a criticality accident, you should be able to detect some above normal background levels of strontium and cesium somewhere at the site. And you should find some dead bodies somewhere or some sick people. Right. And so the Scientech team did just that. I mean, they went out and interviewed people. There was no evidence that anybody had ever gotten ill, that had not been reported properly. They measured, they looked at the environmental surveys. There was no elevated fission products anywhere in the environment. Uh, and they escape, by the way, so you can't keep those contained. There's radioiodine that goes up the stacks. I mean, there's, and, and, and HEPAs don't contain noble gases, and so those go out, and so those would have been detected. And so through stringing all that together, you can prove to yourself that there, the high degree of probability there was never a criticality accident. So why, why did he, he had heard that there was one, or why did he allege it? I have no idea. Oh. That's beyond me. I don't know what his motives were for making the allegations he did. Okay. Um, skip around a little bit. Uh, public has a sense the Rocky Flats was a dangerous place to work, and um, obviously stuff like Jim Stone and FBI raid made that case stronger for the public. Did you did you feel this was so? Um, did you feel that it was a dangerous place? And did your perception of that change over time? Again, asking if, if it was a dangerous place to work and asking if it were, there were dangers, I think, are two different questions. Mm -hmm. um, there were clearly hazards associated with this business. Um, there's industrial hazards, there's radiation hazards, there's chemical hazards. Um, the hazards were there, it was clear. However, I th always thought the hazards were were manageable and well defined mm -hmm. so that if you took care, if you followed the rules, if you paid attention to the things that you were supposed to pay attention to, you could work there safely. 
and so I was never scared about that. Um, the only time I ever got worried from a safety perspective was in the critical mass laboratory. I mean, talking about my own personal safety, mm -hmm. was in the critical mass laboratory. Some of the stuff we had were contemplating doing there um, was is building some, uh, putting fissile material in arrays very close to critical by hand. I mean, very close, deliberately close to critical. And the only way to do that safely was to be very strict about how you handle that material. I mean, very strict. Even to the point where we were running some calculations where it made a difference to where if I was handling, say, a little piece of plutonium in my hand mm -hmm. and I needed to insert it in this array, it made a difference if I did that or if I did that. And, I mean, from a safety perspective. Yeah. Uh, it ma made a difference where my body was. And when we started looking at that, and I was starting, boy, this is getting a little bit, uh, this is a little bit touchy for me. You're doing this in a glove box? Uh, no, this would have been out in the open because it would have been a uh, contained plutonium. It would have been like in right. triple sealed cans um, or uranium at the same time. And uh, we didn't do those experiments, but those are the only times I actually were going, whoa. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure we could ever uh, control the procedures that tightly. Did you uh, say, I don't want to do this experiment? Yeah, that yeah I said that. <laughs> I said that. <laughs> I said that, and we never did those experiments. <laughs> I and several others said that, so this is crazy. So were you ever exposed to radioactive contamination? or? Oh yeah, yeah. There were. Uh, um, I had to personally clean up uh, uranium nitrate spills at the critical mass laboratory. I had a large inventory of uranium nitrate, high enriched uranium, in a, a nitric acid solution. That's yellow, by the way. Real pretty yellow. Bob's probably told you about that, okay. or Bob yeah, Rothy did. Some in his face once. Oh yeah, he's he's been covered in it many times. Yeah. And it's very mild acid, so it's not like it's going to burn you or anything. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I personally cleaned up spills, large, large, multiple liters of spills of that material. Uh, so if you talk about being exposed, yeah, I had anti-seize and inappropriate gloves and, and full face protection, respiratory protection. I was wearing everything I was supposed to wear, uh -huh. but I was in the midst of that, yeah. But you never breathed it in or anything? No. To my knowledge, I've never had any appreciable dose of anything. And I was never in a beryllium area, by the way. I noticed that was one of your questions. Critica being in criticality safety, criticality guys aren't too worried about beryllium. Right. And so we never, I and my staff never ventured forth into any of the beryllium areas. So beryllium was not a hazard for me or my group. How did you feel that the um, media handled, discussed the safety issues at Rocky Fest? Well, at the time uh, that all this was going on, I thought they were probably a little hysterical, <laughs> really. I mean, uh, people weren't dying. Uh, people, there was, there, if you'd listened to a lot of the media, you'd thought that people were dropping dead, you know, at Rocky Flats from radiation or contamination. That just wasn't happening. Doesn't mean that there wasn't some basis for some concerns, but the impression you get just listening to the media was that something really atrocious and awful was happening. And I always thought the safety risks were reasonably well managed. Um, the problem with the site prior to Scientech was, remember it was all in this word of mouth oral tradition. Well that was done that way with everything. Safety was done that way. There's very little paper trails and document records that can show you how the plant knew it was operating safely, say prior to 1990. It was all in people's heads. And so if somebody from outside comes in and says, show me how you know this is, you couldn't. It's in their heads. It's in the way they do it. And so that's the reason why a lot of allegations after, in sort of the 1990 era on, were successful in driving home this image that the plant was operated unsafely, because there was no way to show it 
on paper. It was in people's heads and the way they did business. And then that was part of the whole transition of transitioning to where, okay, you document well the safety analyst thought process. You document the procedures well so that it's no longer an oral tradition, if you will. It's now, it's all on paper. It's all appropriately analyzed and anybody from the outside can come in. Had Rocky done that all those years, it might have been able to show and convince people that they weren't such dastardly individuals. But again, they did cut, they, they did what they were paid to do. And at the time, the government what, didn't put an emphasis on, on environmental management or the same kind of safety culture that we do nowadays. It doesn't mean things were unsafe, it just means you couldn't show it. And you could not bring an uninitiated person and do that stuff safely. Uh. So it's a little, just a different philosophy. Everybody, in some sense, was an expert in their own system their own microcosmic system. So the operator was an expert at what he was doing because he'd operated it 20 years. So he knew what he was doing. Now that if you brought in a new guy, he'd have to kind of be apprenticed. Nowadays, the philosophy is, is no, I have a procedure that contains all the smarts. And so I can bring in a, an inexperienced guy, give him some rudimentary training, and then shove the procedure at him and he can do the job safely because the safety is now in the procedure. And that's a totally different culture than, than the way these plants were historically operated. And so the transition creates some safety issues. Right. Right? You think it's better? Does it work better with the I've, I've, I've said officially it's, it's probably no, no safer, but it costs more. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> But, but again, I'm prejudiced, right? but yes, we, we never had a criticality accident at Rocky Flat, so we must have been doing something right for, for all those years that the plant operated. That wasn't an accident that yeah. that, that happened, so. Um, what did you think, I guess you arrived in 82, so the protests were sort of in full swing, if not waning. Um, what did you think about all that? Oh, I had a several kinds of reactions. I could not believe the public's um, ignorance about radiation and its risks. I found that hard to believe that people really... I had to prep in some of these public meetings, because I was exposed to the public, because I was making public presentations on plutonium in the ducts. Mm -hmm. So I had to get prepared for, you know, what's the average person worried about? And one of the questions I had to prepare for was, is one time somebody asked me, if the electricity that was generated by a nuclear power was radioactive. And it's like, you know, how do you even answer such a question? People have such a fear of radiation that's not based on, on science or fact or physics or biology. It's just this thing that scares them to death. And so it's hard to deal with those irrational kinds of things. You can't attack something that's, you can't, put to bed something that's irrational by producing a very rational argument because you're just operating in a totally different plane. And so you end up having to just convince people through integrity. It also becomes an integrity issue, right? Mm -hmm. Remember this site liked to operate in, in secrecy for so long. So how can you ever pr pr prove to them that you have integrity and you're being open and honest if your whole track record is get away from me, you don't have any rights to say anything. So. Um, I felt for the people. I mean, I honestly felt sorry, and I knew they were scared, and I knew they meant well. I mean, people, people don't react that way unless they have some real honest fear that's driving them, or real concern, mm -hmm. and, and that's reasonable for them to think that. I was just kind of amazed at the um, lack of basic physics knowledge, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Because radiation is part of life. I mean, I was just joking with my family today. I said, you know, you've got a few million neutrinos zapping through you right now, and you've got a lot of cosmic rays happening right now. And I says, you know, your dose of cosmic rays going across on an airplane is a few, few rim if you take a cross-country flight. Living in Boulder, you've got a higher cosmic ray background than we do living here. People don't worry about that, but that's rims, you know? Yeah. It's just that they don't... It's like ignorance is bliss. That radiation can't hurt me, but that radiation can't. I don't understand it. <laughs> My son, you're on camera. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, I am. Yes, sir. Smile. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, we're, um, we're pretty much out of time. I think we covered all the biggies. I think we did, yeah. There's a couple more questions, but I think they, they can wait. <laughs> Somebody else can answer okay. those. All right. Then, uh, well, thank you very much for, You're, you're welcome. For participating. You're welcome.